messages as we look in the Word of God and see what, uh, what the Bible has to say. You know, how often have we talked about the importance, but about the importance of having a, a worldview that's correct? The Bible talks about the worldview that you have. And the Apostle Paul talked about a worldview, and he talked about a godly view of things and a biblical view of things. And so as we talk about the difference between those and today, uh, I think it will help you out in your own particular walk in life. Uh, I think if you're a, a pastor, teacher, counselor, or you minister to people in any other way whatsoever, I believe this will help you. You know, we're living in a world that is so uh, wrapped up in all kinds of, uh, for lack of a better word, just captivity, just bondage in their lives, and very few people really walk around with freedom in their life. Uh, we see everything from the extreme evil in the world that we look at, from mass murders and serial killers and violent sex crimes and all those kind of things, to the, to the smallest of issues in people's lives. And we forget that there really is a wicked force that's loose in the world today. And it really goes beyond just a force. It, it's a personality, you know. You, you, you have to adopt the biblical worldview if you're going to get a proper understanding of things to really realize that not only is there a physical, natural world we see, we hear, we believe, we touch, we taste, we see, that kind of thing goes on. But there's also an unseen world. There's a world which the eyes cannot see. And in, in that world, it's inhabited by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the, the heavenlies, the things that are happening in the very realm around us with uh, fallen angels, we call them demons, or some people call them other things, but the demonic world to Satan himself, this, this fallen angel. It, I think if you don't have a proper view of all these things and how the Bible says we address these kind of things, then at best, not only will you be confused, but at best, probably God will get the blame for everything that goes bad in the world. And he pretty much does anyway, amen? It's amazing, we always want to kick God out of school, kick him out of courts, kick him out of this, kick him out of that, don't want nativity scenes, don't want a cross hanging anywhere, but as soon as there's a problem, we're looking for God. Or as soon as something bad happens, we want to blame God for what's taking place. Uh, and so as I talk about these things today, I, I want to talk about freedom in our spiritual life, and our spiritual walk. Where is this thing coming up here? There we go. And just what it means to really break free in your life. I've seen people in, in counseling situations from everything from extreme radical cases where you just knew this guy was having problems with the demonic world, was manifesting all these kind of things to the, to the other extreme of people just, you know, uh, with no joy in their life. And if we don't understand and, and take the proper approach to the issues that we face, uh, we're going to have a lot of problems that we don't know how to deal with. And I've dealt with people in counseling situations from things where people are hearing voices in their head. They're telling them to do certain things or hurt themselves or hurt other people. And it's audible to them, to, uh, you know, to others who are captured by impure thoughts and just can't get rid of those things or are captured by fear in their life and they just can't seem to get, find freedom in their life or doubts or insecurities. Uh, you know, uh, others who just want help in, in and fighting through the barrage of thoughts that they're having, they know that are negative and that are causing them all kinds of problems in their life. To Christians who can't concentrate when it comes to prayer or to read the Bible. I've had a lot of people say, well, you know, I just can't read the Bible. Uh, why is that? You know, well, what's going on? I just I, I get down to pray and I just can't pray. And, uh, and their lives are filled with the insecurities, doubts, fears of all different kinds. And many Christians, I believe, don't realize the source of a lot that goes on in their life. And they're, they're living, you know, the exact opposite of what the Bible says they could live. And the Bible talks about joy and full of glory and peace that passes understanding and, you know, abundant life. Jesus said, I've come you have abundant life. And, you know, you look at most Christians and in the, in the famous quote of Bill Stafford, they look like they've been sucking oatmeal out of Coke bottles, you know. <laughs> it's just no, no joy. There's no freedom in their life. There's... They're, they're, where is the joy that, that's full of glory in the Christian's life? Uh, I, I sometimes talk with people who, I know the Lord, I have Christ in my life. It's like, it's like the, you're looking at a blank page. There's just no personality, you know, and that's not the norm, you know, for the Christian life. Jesus made some pretty bold promises in Scripture, and I think that uh, if, if, if those aren't happening in my life, I, I want to have enough integrity with myself to say, hey, either God's dead or something's wrong with me. Now, let me clarify real quick. God's not dead. So where does that leave us? <laughs> All right. Something must be wrong with me in regard. Maybe it's my understanding of Scripture or God himself. And then you see people who have all kinds of other bondage in their life, and sometimes it's simply a lack of discipline in their life. Sometimes they don't know how to fight in a spiritual battle, and sometimes it's deception in their life. Then those areas of bondage that, that you, uh, you know, but people won't refer to as bondage 
in their life, but they're really inside, they're, they're in a bondage. They just can't get free. Things like we would simply call maybe, it's a failure. I have this little failure. And I had it again today and yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. It's more than a little failure if it keeps being repeated in your life. Sometimes we just say, well, you know, it's not an addiction, just a bad habit. No difference, by the way. <laughs> you know, it, it's the old uh, concept of, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, you know, but those results aren't happening. Then something's wrong with your way of thinking and your perception. In fact, that's also been given as the definition for insanity. Then there's those obvious big things. We talk about alcoholism and drug addictions and porn addictions. And people, yeah, those are terrible. But then when you start talking about other things like, I'm a constant gossip. Well, that's got to be something different than those other things, doesn't it? Or I'm an habitual liar. You know, I'm always, no, I'm passionate. I don't lie. I exaggerate. That's a lie, all right? And, and you know, from adultery to immorality to lying to cheating, all these things that seem to be repetitive and keeping over and over. And, and people just don't seem to realize that there's a point to be broke. That those things break off your life and you become, what well, Jesus says, free indeed. You know, the truth, the truth shall set you free. And Jesus said, when I say you're free, you will be free indeed, real freedom. Now, in, in regard to believers, those of us who do know Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's been a point in our life where we've, kind of come to the end of ourselves and our beginning with Jesus and we're starting our life and walk with him. There's really two areas that you look at in, in your Christian life that you have to attend to. One is your spiritual maturity. The Bible says that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? So we're supposed to be growing. There's no point where we kind of stop and we've reached it, you know. Now, if you think you're there, you're not, all right? That's a sure sign you're not there. You just don't get there until we're in heaven, all right? There's always, a, there's always something in our life that we can be growing on and we can be advancing in and we become more like Christ in and God's doing a deeper work in our lives, our homes, our marriage, every area of our life, maturity. The second area for the Christian that we should keep our eye on is this thing we're talking about, freedom. We should be discovering freedom in our Christian walk in life regularly. And it's, it's it really, I, I told people before, I said, you know, your life is, is, is it's like a book and there's all these pages that God deals with. When I gave my life to Jesus, we opened up to page one. So you really hadn't even begun living till you give your life to Christ. Because God has a determined destiny for you. It goes beyond fate. God has a will, he has a purpose, he has a plan for your life. And so it's like, here's the book, I'm gonna open up to page one, and what's God saying? Today I've given my life, I'm born again. I'm, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. And everything's good, praise the Lord, until God begins to go to work in us. And he gets, begins to get all the junk out and all the garbage out and all the trash out. And so that's page two. You need to quit smoking. Hey, I didn't say that. <laughs> it's not the Bible, it's my life. It's something the Lord said to me. You need to stop that. Stop that. You gonna be free? You know, well, I'm free. <laughs> oh, where's that cigarette butt? <laughs> Digging through the ashtray looking for a cigarette butt. That, that's not freedom, all right? You're not free. Where's my skull? I gotta get my pocket out I think the thing that really caught me, my brother gave me that famous phrase that was, you know, kissing a smoker is like licking an ashtray. <laughs> and I thought, maybe there's something to that. So anyway, there, there's just areas, you know, and if you say, well, that, please understand, that's not what's going to get you to heaven. It's your faith in Christ that gets you to heaven. But the Lord does want you free. He wants you material. He wants you whole. He wants you growing. He wants you free from the things that would just bind you down or destroy your health or ruin your life. He wants you free, you know, and, and we need to discover that. So what we want to do is give this kind of introduction, but I want to tie into this whole introduction is, is that there are forces at play here that if you're not aware of, or if they're not a part of your worldview, then you're going to lose the battle right off the bat. All right. You're going to lose that. It's not just a matter of discipline sometimes, but discipline is important. You know, there's this area of spiritual freedom, and many Christians never go into spiritual freedom. They live lives in captivity spiritually. They don't go into maturity because they're not free. Those things are working together. So I want to talk first and foremost today about some common misconceptions about spiritual bondage and what it means. I mean, uh, from one hand of where do the voices come from, or to the other hand, where does all the confusion come from? You know, why all these divergent thoughts and notions and there are these condemning things are going on and my, my, I'm just cluttered. I, I have trouble even focusing sometimes. 
How do we deal with these things? Well, let's look at the misconceptions first. In the next few weeks, we'll look at the proper concept of what the Bible teaches us from just from a biblical worldview instead of a, an earthly worldview. So first of all is this. Here's what a lot of people believe, and it, it is a misconception, is that demons were active when Christ was on the earth, but their activity has subsided today. Follow me around. Christians who hold this extreme in, in the light of what God's word says, uh, you know, and what's transpiring in the world today, you are simply not facing reality. There is an evil, and it goes beyond just a force. It deals with personalities. There is a devil that's fallen from heaven that has been thrown out of heaven onto the earth. There are demons that transpired in his conspiracy were also cast out of heaven, and there's literally multiplied millions. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, when John is caught up into the heavens, and he's given us the description of heaven and the end times, he said, and I saw round about the throne of God ten thousands of ten thousands of ten thousands of angels. Basically, in mathematical terms, that's ten thousands to the 10,000th power to the 10,000th power. Multiplied millions upon millions and millions and millions of angels around the throne of God. Now that's after one third have already gone. There's still that many there. So there are millions and millions and millions of, we can call them demons, some people don't like that term, but they are fallen angels, all right, that left the kingdom of heaven and have been bound to the planet, all right? And this becomes their domain ever since the fall of man. Adam's sin, you know, ushered, uh, it basically Satan have authority. Uh, Adam and Eve gave the keys up to the house, basically. And now the Bible calls even Satan, using a little g, the God of this world. But the New Testament clearly states, I mean, if you're going to read your Bible, and you think, well, I don't believe in demons or this stuff, you know, that, that's all back in Jesus' time. Well, you have to understand the scripture says, in speaking and addressing to Christians in Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not, you might underline that, is not against flesh and blood. In other words, my battle's not with you. Your battle's not with me. The real battle is against rulers. He's talking about spiritual forces here. Powers against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness that are fighting in heavenly places in the world around us. I believe that what he's saying here, and it's pretty clear that Christians will wrestle against rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. That there is a war that is going on. And then Paul later goes on this chapter and begins to itemize the armor that we're to wear in battle. And he talks about its use in the battle. And it should be that thing that defends us from the flaming missiles of the evil one. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians these words in 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, this physical body, we do not war. Our battle is not according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. He says it very clearly again but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying, what are these fortresses? What are these strongholds, it says in one translation? We're destroying, here's what the fortresses are made of, speculations, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying, spiritual forces are still attacking Christians, and you need to be ready for it. There are spiritual forces that are working against you to wreck your life and to ruin your life and to keep your life miserable. Satan does not want you to enjoy all that Christ has died to give you. Satan does not want you to exercise what is yours according to the scripture of your inheritance in Christ Jesus. And in reality, as a believer, you only have, you know, uh, the options in the conflict are this. How am I going to fight the fight? And to what extent am I going to wage this battle? You're going to fight the fight. You'll be taken as a prisoner and you'll live in captivity or you'll stand and you'll face the enemy and realize that the victory is yours, but it has to come through God-given means. If your worldview as a Christian does not include this whole concept of spiritual battle and the kingdom of darkness, and as we said earlier, God then takes the bum rap for anything bad that happens in your world. The second misconception is this. What the early church called demonic activity again, this is a misconception, we now understand just to be mental illness. Now, this is very popular among Christians, all right? Very popular among the world. You know, I, I heard one counselor argue, you know, concerning this demonically, obviously disturbed person. He says, there's just no way this problem can be demonic. He's just a paranoid schizophrenic. 
Let me tell you about titles and names and labels in the context of psychiatry and psychology. Simply, accepting psychology's definition of human problem in no way establishes the cause of the problem. The title is just a title that talks about the symptoms. This is what's happening in this person's life. But the question gets to this point, what is causing those problems? When you talk about terms like schizophrenia, and paranoia, and psychosis, these issues, etc., they're just labels that are classifying symptoms in human behavior. This is what they are. You have this problem. But, but, but what causes the symptoms? All right. What's going on here? I mean, is it, is it a neurological issue? It could be. Is it a chemical imbalance? It could be. Or is it a hormonal problem? I remember Kathy and I had been dealing with a lady for a long time who was having I mean, voices in her head and all kinds of problems and things that were going on. And finally, just listening to the Spirit of God one day, we said, listen, beyond, let, let's move to another ca category here. We've been dealing with on a spiritual basis. I said, but let's, 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 let's involve a particular doctor that we knew who was, you know, that was his, his field of interest, was in women's health and in hormones and all that. And, uh, man, she had all kinds of imbalances, physical imbalances in her life. And when all those got together, the voices went away, the struggle stopped. It was a whole new world for her. So that could have been a problem. So it could, that could be the problems in the day. But that's not always. I mean, certainly you have to explore those options, right? I mean, if we're going to treat anything. But what if there's no physical cause that it's found, like a neuro neurological problem or hormonal imbalance or, or something on that line, like a neurology in, in, in that particular area? What if there's no physical cause that's found to these particular things? Then we say then it's, it's a psychological problem. And we talk about the psychology. Let's talk about man as a soul. His mind, his will, and, and his emotions, all right? So we'll, we'll look at it that way. So it's just psychological. Okay, so, well, it's, it's, it's not physical, then it must be psychological, mental, spiritual, something going on here. If we, we, we say, okay, it's, it's not those things, then it must be this, then we have to make our decision. What avenue, what route are we going to follow? You know, it, it, is it going to be a biblical view of, of the problem, or is it going to be just a secular view of the problem? And it shouldn't surprise us that most secular psychologists today are limited to a very natural view of the world that it doesn't include God, it doesn't include demons, it doesn't include these things that the Bible talks about, wherein it's a biblical view does include God in this whole arena of thought. It's not just what's going on physically, but there's this new thing that's introduced, and it's the spirit realm, and it's the spirit of God. Scientific investigations uh, of spiritual problems from a secular point, are always incomplete. If you're ignoring God and you're ignoring the devil, then you're really not taking a big picture look at what the problem might be because they're not going to involve God or the devil they, because, you know, they may not exist in their mind. Let me put it this way. As we move forward, they break it down to this. So they say, well, there's some problems then are, are psychological and sometimes they're spiritual. And I, I don't agree with that. I think if you take a biblical worldview, this, this implies, in that, in that misconception, implies that there's a division between the human soul and the spirit. And it doesn't exist. In fact, there's only one thing in all of the world that we live in, and the Bible addresses it, that can kind of show you or separate soul and spirit. And it's the Word of God that says, you know, it brings a division between joints and marrow, soul and spirit. So it's only, it's only truth of God's word that can address the real issues in, in people's hearts and lives. And, and if you really get down to it, we are so integrated that if I have a problem you know, in my life and it's a physical problem, it affects me in every area of my life. I mean, if, if my foot hurts today and my leg's cramping, for some reason I'm just not interested in spending much time in prayer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If I have a bad nausea or something, I pray, oh, God, help me, maybe. <laughs> but in my spiritual discipline. But let's talk about, move the, the physical out of the side, and let's talk about the psychological. Let's look at the soul of man. He's mind, he's will, and emotion. How are you going to distinguish those? We can kind of give him titles. This is his mind, and this is his will, this is his emotions. We look at that, but all those things are integrated. So if I have a mental problem, guess what? I've usually got an emotional problem to go with it. Don't say amen. We're not talking about me specifically. <laughs> You know, if I, if I have an emotional problem, then I usually have a problem with my will. I mean, it's like trying to dissect the Trinity. It's just, it's, it's, how, how do you do that? Because God has made us this unique Trinity. So well, let me say what I'm saying is it, simple. There, if, if it's a psychological problem, it's also a spiritual problem. Because of the uniqueness 
of the human. And when you get saved, something happens within this vessel called your body, where your mind and your will and your emotions are. What happens is the spirit is brought alive. Until we meet Jesus, the Bible says that we're dead spiritually. All right? When Adam sinned in the garden, he died spiritually. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, you must be born again. He's talking about his spiritual life. The Bible tells us that the, that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. In other words, our, our spirit is dead until we meet Jesus. We're soullessly alive, we're physically alive, we're mentally alive, we're emotionally alive, but in our spirit. So when the spirit comes alive, it lightens us. And God brings light and he brings life to us. But if we don't recognize that, then we're certainly going to miss the mark. But for the Christian, there's no time, and really even for the person who doesn't know Christ, there's no time when God's not present. All right? And there's no time for a Christian when it's safe to take off your spiritual armor. You can't take like spiritual vacations. You know, I'm going to take off my spiritual armor and go over here and be okay. You won't be okay. You're going to come under greater attack. The fourth misconception is this, and we're going to deal with all this in, in a greater detail, so don't let me confuse you too much. The fourth misconception is this, is that Christians aren't subject to demonic activities. Now, if the Christian is not subject to a demonic activity and to the enemy, then why does the Bible tell us all these things like put on the armor, resist the devil, stand firm, you know, to, to be alert, to be vigilant? Well, in fact, all those warnings in the New Testament are written to Christians, yes. not to lost people. He's saying, you put on the armor, you take up the sword, you put on the shield, you put on the helmet, you put on the breastplate, you realize you have an enemy. He walks around like a roaring lion, written to believers, seeking some believer that he may devour. So there's no point in time where I can just go on vacation spiritually. But let me ask you this question. Knowing that, how many of us really, that's, that's in our thought? Knowing that, we, we still think that, we have that Bible verse down, but we still sometimes often tend to believe that my problems are just physical. In other words, if so-and-so would change, life would be better. You know, if my wife would behave herself, I'd be happy. All right? If my husband wasn't such a jerk, you know, things would be better. If my kids weren't, I, I believe in demons, they're my children. If, if my kids weren't demons, if they weren't like that, you know, they're little devils, you know. Then, then, then if they could just straighten out, then I could be a spiritual mother. You know? How often have you walked in, and I'm talking to people who have a little bit of spiritual sense here, I hope. Uh, you gone home and it's just absolute chaos in the house. I mean, the dog's mad at somebody and somebody's mad at the dog and mama's screaming, the kids are screaming, you know, the cousins are over, the neighbor. It's just chaos. And, all you, and so you get in on it. You're going to kick the dog, yell at the wife, scream at the kids. And when you, when you move into that, you see, you're living, with a, you're living with a worldview that's secular. But when you start realizing I'm in the armor, I'm going to walk as God wants me to walk. I'm going to live with a spiritual hind, with some spiritual mindset. I'm going to start realizing that, hey, you know, my battle here is not against my wife. It's not against my kids and not even against the poor dog. It's a spiritual battle. And maybe the best thing I could do is before I yell at anybody is just stop everybody and say, hey, everybody, I got an idea. Let's have a word of prayer. Yeah. Or if you think that's going to create a bigger conflict, just go to the bedroom and pray yourself. Amen. And just say, you know, Lord, you tell me in the Bible that I belong to you. And you tell me that my family belongs to you. And you tell me this is your house and everything out in the earth belongs to you. So the devil doesn't have a right to be here today. So I'm just going to stand on you, understanding what the Bible says, that I have victory and authority and power in you, and just agree with you today that the enemy's defeated and he has to get out of my house today. And yet we call ourselves spiritual, and that's the last thing that goes through our minds. Amen? But this idea that, that we're not subject to any kind of, of, of the enemy's effect in our life, boy, man, you're just opening the door up for problems if you, if you believe that way. The fifth is this, the demonic influence is only evident in extreme or violent behavior and gross sin. You know, it's kind of like the, the story in, in Luke 8 or in Mark 5 about the, the, the man called Legion. You know, Jesus steps out of the boat and here's this screaming, raging demoniac. He's naked. He's cutting himself with stones. You know, people have tried to bind him with chains to help him. You know, he's, he's, he's running through the cemetery. Seminary. <laughs> Sometimes there too. <laughs> <laughs> running through the, the cemetery, you know, screaming. And, you know, most people look at him and say, oh, he's, he's full of demons. Jesus said, you know, what's your name? Legion, for we are many. And then they realize who's talking. They say, oh! Jesus. <laughs> it all changes real quick. Oh, what are we to do with you? 
don't, don't throw us into the abyss. Let us go to the pigs. You see how they respond to Jesus and his power. And this is the way it is all the way through scripture. But for us to get this idea that, you know, that I'm not being bothered by demons because I'm not running through the, the, the cemetery naked, you know, cutting myself with stones. So everything, I just got some problems. You need to be cautious and realize, you know, there's a lot of Christians that are suffering from, from the enemy's attack upon their life and still leading relatively normal lives. But yet they're in bondage, you know. Since they, since they relegate Satan's involvement to the mass murderers or the serial killers, people like that, you know, the violent rapists or something, you know, they just, their, their situation is different. They just kind of live with this mindset, I can do better. And they try in the energy of their flesh to fight a spiritual battle. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to be a better person. It gets that whole thing. I'm going to turn over a new leaf, you know. I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments. Oh, there's a good one. Why don't you just do that today? Let's see what happens. Start with thou shalt not lie. <laughs> because in the energy of our flesh, and just human fallen nature, we can't do or be or overcome the things that God would have us be or do or overcome. We need him in our lives. And too many Christians wake up every day and, and this is not even in their mindset that they're in a spiritual arena and it is a battlefield. It is an arena where there's a war going on. And they don't think, I have a problem because what do we do? We just believe our own, the thoughts come in our minds, oh, you're okay. And, and by the way, man, school, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Well, that's fine. You go ahead and live that way if you want to be like everybody else. Be miserable. Amen. You, you can be miserable. You, you, you can make that decision. Or you can say, this is not what Jesus died for. This is not what the Bible promises. Where's this peace that passes understanding? You know? Where's this joy that's full of glory? Where's this abundant living that Jesus said was mine? Have life and life more abundantly. This ain't abundant. I'm an abundant mess. You know? Where's what God says to me? So you have to realize, you know, that, hey, there are problems, and Satan will love to convince you that he's not at the root of it. That's why the Bible tells us that you know, Paul warned about Satan disguising himself as an angel of light. And it goes on to say, and it's, it is no secret that his servants disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Satan dis disguises himself as an angel of light. His little demons, they're not going to expose themselves for the darkness they are. They're going to come along as little helpers. Oh, what you need to do is just do this and you'll be a better person. And don't do that so much. Or try harder. Or you can offset that thing that's really bad in your life by being better over here. You know, kind of transfer the credits. And our mind gets so warped about what's really going on that there's a battle going on. And if I, if I don't recognize it, number one, I'll stay lost and die and go to hell, which God never intended that for my life. That's why he sent Jesus to intervene so I, I can have life. And so I can choose Christ. But in choosing Christ, I realize now that I've really entered the field and the arena of war. And I have to make some smart decisions in my life and not believe every little thought that comes into my head. The, the sixth thing is that's a misconception is that freedom from spiritual bondage is the result of a power encounter with demonic forces. Some people have a problem spiritually and they think they need to go find some deliverance minister. All right. And the deliverance minister sits there over you and he's praying and he's calling out demons. What's your name? You know, and all this stuff. I jury you by the power of God, anoint you with some holy water or whatever. You, you, you've seen the movies. And you're not going to ever be free to have that. And most people say, I ain't going there, I ain't going there, I ain't going there. <laughs> now, that's, that's not the way to freedom necessarily either, folks. I believe sometimes when you need some people who will walk you through in situations or deeper counseling for your life and show you how to pray through things. But the freedom from demonic forces is not a result of some kind of power encounter. It's the truth that exposes Satan. It's the truth that sets you free. It's the truth of God's words that will make a difference in your life. Because when the truth comes on, the Bible calls it light, right? And Satan's kingdom is darkness. So when the light comes on, man, God starts moving. You know, how many of y'all have ever lived in an apartment in Houston, Texas? Y'all remember those days? I had some of those days. What happens? You leave the house, you know, and you walk back in, turn the lights on, there's a million cockroaches. <laughs> Welcome to Houston. Man, they're carting off your TV, <laughs> eat everything in the, in the refrigerator, wherever they can get, man, they're, just, they're mauling you, you know? Turn the lights on them, they're gone. That's the way the enemy is when Jesus gets around. Just look at every reaction to light when Jesus shows up. What are we to do with him? We're out of here. But yet we respond just differently. And it's because we really don't know who we are in Christ. It's like, 
And I remember reading Dr. Anderson's, Neil Anderson's book, if you ever read Bondage Breaker, it's a great book. And he, he uses the illustration in Bondage Breaker. Uh, he says, I was, I was going to see some people one day and I got out of the house, and I mean, out of my truck and pick up into the yard and had this little yappy dog. You know, these little tiny dogs that make a lot of noise, have big teeth, you know, they show them. But it's just a little dog. This thing's just going after me, making all kinds of noise. And he said, man, I, he said, I, I reacted in fear. I jumped up on my truck. <laughs> then with that dog. He said, then I realized, well, that's pretty stupid. You can step on the dog and kill him. <laughs> so I got off the truck, told him to scat, threw a rock at him, kicked a rock at him, and he ran off screaming. That's just the way Satan is when we begin to discover the power of God. That's just the mind, but that's the last thing that the enemy wants you to understand and to know. He, he's just like that yappy little dog deceiving people into fearing him more than do God. His power is where? It's in the lie. That's what he's told in Genesis. That's what he's told ever since the book of Genesis. It's always in the lie. In fact, the Bible calls him the father of lies in John chapter 8. Jesus refers to him. In Revelation 12, 9, when he's talking about his demise is coming, it calls him the deceiver of the whole world. He's a liar. Consequently, first John, John wrote, he said, listen, and the whole world is under his influence. Most people believe the lie. Now for Christians, let me wrap up with this. There's nothing he can do about, if you're a believer, there's nothing he can do about your position in Christ. He can't push you out. He can't move you out. You are in Christ. You're a new person. You have a right to be what God's called you to be. You have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. You have authority. But if he can trick you into believing his lies about you, like you have to, Everybody else is doing so you might as well. There's just no way, you know. I mean, how many are so susceptible and don't realize you come into church and maybe one of the ushers or one of the deacons and, you know, you've known him all your life. You walk in the door and you shake his hand and maybe you don't get the response to the happy face you wanted when you first walked in. And you walk away and say, he must not like me. And then you live the rest of the next five years figuring, why didn't he like me? He didn't like me. Where did you get that idea? Was it the devil? I don't know. Does it matter? It's not right. Some people say, well, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Bible talks about bringing your thoughts captivity to Jesus, and I have some really bad thoughts, and I don't want him to see them. Excuse me, God's omniscient. He sees all your dirty laundry, even when you hide it in the dark. You're not hiding anything from God. I don't care where you go, how dark it gets, how, if nobody else is around, none of the Christians you know around, it's a secret thing, he still sees it. We just believe stuff. We just feel stuff. Well, that's just the way I feel. And people tell me all the time, well, what's the matter? I just don't feel good today. Okay. So you're just going to be miserable? You're going to be miserable to be around just because you don't feel good. I don't feel good. So I'll make everybody else feel bad. <laughs> Where's all this start? It starts right here. The speculations, the thoughts, the mind. It's not distinguishing, was it the devil? Is it me? Is it what? Is it the weather? What is it? No, it's just get rid of it. I'm, I'm going to bring those things. The Bible says submit them to the captivity of Jesus, and we're talking a whole lot more about that. But let me just say this. You are, because you are in Jesus Christ, you're a child of the truth. And if you follow the sequence of scriptures, it starts like this. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You want to be free? It starts with Jesus. You can go through all the programs you want to go through, all the psychiatrists you want to go through, all the counselors you want to go through, but if you don't start with truth, you'll never be free. You may just be reformed, but we don't need a reformation. We need a transformation that literally changes us. And that's the power of God's word. So it starts with knowing the truth. And after that, Jesus tells us that not only do we know the truth, he says, I am the truth. It's me. So if you want to know truth, you start with Jesus. If you reject Jesus, you'll live a lie the rest of your life. And he goes on to say, but he, when the spirit of truth comes, Jesus said, I'm going, I'm sending the spirit. And when he comes, guess what he's going to do? He's going to guide you to truth. He's going to lead you to truth. Because why? That's what we need in the, in the battle. It's truth. And then he goes on to say, Jesus is praying right after he's told his disciples this. Listen, Father, I, I don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. And he uses this word sanctify. It means set them apart from the evil one. And how are you going to set them, set them apart in the truth? Don't let them believe lies. Don't let them get caught up in a lie. Don't get them wrapped up in a lie. Don't let them wreck their life with the lies. Move them over to the truth. And where are they going to get the truth? Your word's the truth. So why do you think the enemy doesn't want you reading this book? He doesn't want you to know this. That's why when you start to open your Bible and say, you know, I need to have a little time in the Word. Oh, man, I need to do something. I need to go check, check the car. You know, the dog's got to go out the potty. You know, you got 40,000 things that pop in your mouth. Like, Where's that? What is that? Spiritual warfare. He doesn't want you in the Bible. He doesn't want that going on in your life. 
But I want you to know, you can pretend to be a really good Christian. You can put on a good facade and everybody just thinks you're Mr. Spiritual or you're Mrs. Holy. If you're never in the Word, it's a facade. And every, anybody can pull it off. Some better than others, but still can pull it off. We need to be in the truth. That's what transforms our life. The fifth thing in this whole sequence is you stand firm. Have your loins girded about with truth. That's part of the, the spiritual battle. How are you going to live? You've got to believe the truth. Quit believing others. Quit believing people. Quit believing things. Quit believing, you know, the, the news. I mean, you want to get depressed and live in depression, just watch the news. I'd rather listen to what God says about me than what the world says about me. Finally, brethren, whatever's true, think on these things. Quit believing the lies and don't even entertain the lies. It's interesting that when God first disciplined the church, what was it over? Remember if you read the Bible in Acts chapter 5 or 6 where it is where he talks about Ananias and Sapphira lying? And the whole discipline of the Holy Spirit was the fact that God exposes his lie within the church. Why? Because that is so important in the kingdom of God that the lies are dealt with and that we learn who we are in Christ. The greatest way to freedom in your spiritual life is know who you are in Christ. Know who you are in Jesus. Know what his word says about you. Know what it says about your life. Know what it says about your family. Know what it says about your situation. And I do not believe there's anything in your life you'll, you'll have to face it. God doesn't deal with it in some way, in some format, in some principle, in his word. But freedom is yours. This is the prayer we ought to pray as Paul prayed. I pray that the eyes of our heart be enlightened so that we may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? We need to know what he's given us. What's the surpassing greatness of his power? Words, we know how powerful God made us towards us who believe. And all these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. Words, everything you need, you find in Jesus Christ. Because he raised him from the dead. And when he did, he seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all the rule of authority, power and dominion. Words, he's bigger than the devil. He's more powerful. Every name this name is going to submit to that one of Jesus. So when you read through the, scriptures, uh, through the scriptures, you're going to discover that one thing's really obvious. You're free in Christ. You say, well, I'm not. It's because you don't know the truth. Or you're not believing the truth. And you're not confessing the truth. And you're not standing on the truth. You've chosen to say, my way is better than the truth. Simple question. How's that working for you? How's that working for you? There's a higher life. And it's not this phony church hypocrisy that's so easy to embrace. It's just being genuine, being real, letting God do something powerful in your life, setting you free, giving your heart for other people, giving your heart for, 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 for Him and for His Word. Let's find out what it means to discover who we really are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's break free. Amen? Praise the Lord. A couple things. Uh, if you're going to be baptized this morning, you're helping me with that, you are dismissed to go get up to the room and prepare yourselves quickly. If you're slow, we'll just throw you in. <laughs> Those we don't get to today, we'll get next week. <laughs> so we're going to have a baptismal service in just a minute, but I was given a list to read to you. This is Pastor Strickland's. I'm sure I will not do it as good as he does. Announcements. Now, if you're the average Baptist like me, you hate announcements. So let's make this painless. Everybody smile. Let's say this to the person next to you. I love announcements. And since you don't have to get your Bible or anything ready just yet because the service is not over, we're getting ready to have the announcements. First of all, the, the last Sunday of every month, we don't have any evening activities, all right? We call it family night, no evening activities. The next thing is tomorrow here at the church from 10 to 2, we're having rad day, all right? It's our young people, teenagers, junior high school. Come on up to church. We're going to have some fun, have fellowship together. You do not want to miss that. Do they need any money or anything like that? They want to bring me an offering or anything? Okay. Next thing. You should have received... If they thought you were married, you should have received one of those brochures on the marriage retreat. Right. People getting baptized, so we're kind of rushing things, so we got them all, we think we got them all ready. So praise the Lord, we're going to be stirring the baptism waters this morning. They're praying as I'm, we heard the big clap, so we're letting them pray right there, so I thought I better get on out there before we have a riot going on, so. Uh, but anyway, we praise the Lord as baptism, as I've described the one who is contemplating baptism, would you like the person that you're about to marry say, you know what, I want to marry you, 
but I want to do it in private. I don't want anybody to know about it. Now, you won't want to marry that person. You say, I want you to be proud of me that everybody knows. And that's what these people, they've come to know Christ, but they want to make it public so that everybody in the world knows that they're not ashamed to follow Christ. Amen? So we're going to allow, uh, Philip Dutton's going to baptize a couple of guys that are uh, in the youth. So Philip, you'll go ahead and come on out. We'll go ahead and let him baptize those two guys, and then we'll get the other ones after that. Camden, you got something you want to say? I do. Uh, two years ago, my family and I came to this church, and you guys are really nice. You guys are a great church family. And um, I started out going to Don's Bible study on Sundays because I didn't really, uh, I didn't want to go to with the kids and whatnot. So um, I guess the Lord was pushing on my dad telling him that I had to go. So <laughs> finally I did, and um, I met this really nice lady, Crystal, and she, um, she's what had me go to uh, Student Life, and she's the one who led me to the Lord, and I got saved. Cameron, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You got something you'd like to share? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I started coming to this church when I was eight. I only came like once, twice a year, depending on where I was with my granddad. And I just started coming to the church a lot whenever I moved to Tomball. And my granddad picked me up every Sunday, every Wednesday. And um, I just want to thank him for being able to take me and go out of his way to bring me up here. And I just want to thank Crystal for welcoming me to the youth group. I've been truly blessed by them. Um, they made a huge impact on my life. And um, I just, I'm just, uh, and then we went to Belize. And we went to Belize. I made one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in my life. I was unsure if I was saved. And I'm happy I made that decision to be sure. First, can I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? girls. Amen. So if Autumn, if she would come, Autumn Maguki, she's coming to make her profession of faith public this morning. Autumn, you have a word of testimony of what Christ has done? Yeah. Um, I got saved last October after like two to three years about being unsure if I was saved. And we went to student life camp and I talked to Crystal about it. And um, it took me a few months. <laughs> with praying and trying to decide and well figuring out if I was saved and God showed me that I wasn't so um, I texted her and asked her if we could meet one afternoon after church and she said yeah and she led me to Christ Amen. Praise the Lord Amen. Then Autumn upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and we got uh, Mark is coming now. Mark Porter. That's more, eh? <laughs> Come around here. Oh, oh. He almost baptized himself right there. <laughs> Did a little candy bomb. Mark, you want to give a word of testimony of what Christ has done while you're here being baptized? Uh, for y'all little ones, I, I'm actually starting a new life. My mom helped me be a Christian, and I really thank my mom and Matt. 
Campbell. Yep. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That he came to know Christ. Then Mark, upon your profession of Christ and our Lord, or, or your testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. coming to make his walk with Christ public here as a believer in Christ. Nathan, you want to give a word of testimony while you're here today? Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nathan. Do you really? What? Okay. Right. Have you come? <laughs> I get you. Have you prayed to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. And you're following him with your whole heart? Amen. Well, that's what matters. Did you hold your nose? I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Jason White's coming at this time to make his profession of faith public. All right, Jason, you want to give a word of testimony of what Christ has done? I was saved when I was 12 years old, and I'm uh, mighty grateful to be here. I truly feel the Lord speaks to me in this ministry. Amen. Praise the Lord. And Jason, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we have Lydia Staggs, who's coming to make her profession of faith public. Lady, you want to give a word of testimony of what Christ has done? Yes. Uh, I go in and it's all. Um, I used to get to hell. Doctors say that heroin is like, doctors say that this is literally the most that your joy, the most joy that your brain can reach. And that the, the withdrawals from it is literally the worst that you can feel. Um, through withdrawals, I was, I just was like, oh, I had hit rock bottom. I had nowhere to go but up. And so I'm just like, I give it to you. I obviously can't do this by myself. So I've gotten saved many times, but this time I actually gave my life to God. I, Every single day, I just live and I just trust in him for literally everything. And every single day, I get a little stronger and a little happier, and there's a little more peace. And I was able to find the most joy I've ever felt through withdrawing off heroin. That's, you're supposed to be just, I'm still supposed to be completely depressed and in pain <laughs> right now. But, I mean, I couldn't fake this smile. This is, <laughs> I mean... And this, it, it blows my mind every single day that what, the only thing I regret is not making this decision sooner. And, but, I mean, God brought me to this point when and where I needed to be for a reason. And now that I've hit rock bottom, I can be, and I already have been of encouragement to so many people. I mean, I go into Walmart and I'm just like, you know, direct my shopping trip in Walmart <laughs> and I find somebody to talk to and I tell them the story and then they're like, I don't even know who you were, but I can <laughs> see who you are now. And that's just... I mean, they say it's like the fear of God. Like I'm, I only fear of living my life without him. Again, that's just... I can never imagine I would have ever been this happy. <laughs> no drug or nothing can ever do that. I was so reliant on anything but God. And I, doctors say I had reason to. I, I had a reason to smoke weed every day and to pop whatever pills I wanted to. But, you know, it, 
I stopped treating the symptoms and started praying for healing because I, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> Every single day I just, I just, I mean it's joy, it's not just happiness, it's complete joy. Like, you know when you're getting chased when you're a kid and you're like, I can't breathe, like, like that's how it is. Like I just get overwhelmed, I can't even breathe sometimes. And, man. <laughs> Thank you for saving me. I'm so thankful. Amen. Amen. Take that, devil. Amen. <laughs> We're talking about the demons. That, uh, the devil has fled. He's got no victory. And Lydia's been part of our family. And it's a pleasure to see you here. And we're just so joyful for you that today. So, Lady, upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I've got bad news. That's it. <laughs> Except for you. Maybe you've never made your commitment to Christ public. Or maybe you've maybe never made it real. Like Lydia, I know you understand what she meant when she said, got saved several times. And she got saved this time because she made him the Lord of her life. Maybe you've been waiting around. Maybe today's baptism service and today's message have been a one-two. Make this three to make your decision for Christ public. Because if you're ashamed of him here, you'll never walk with him out there. So we welcome you. We're going to have a baptism service next Sunday too. And maybe you need to be up here for what Christ has done in your life. You know, Brother Joe's already taken care of the announcements. And uh, tonight, you know, is we have a family night, so no services. So I guess we'll see you on Wednesday.